Thank you. Good to be with you again. So my first direct personal experience of an acute and massive environmental issue came in June 2013. It was about 10 months after I had first moved to Malaysia. And so from the lofty perch of my sixth floor apartment, I watched for two days as a strange looking cloud slowly moved towards us. And then the haze soon engulfed us for several days. Well, some of my local colleagues told me this was not the worst year of the haze ever. It was more than enough for me. My wife and children all came down with flu-like symptoms, and it was impossible to escape the acrid burning smell of that cloud. All in all, though, we were lucky. My family's physical reactions were minor and did not require medical attention. And the pollution indexes were much lower where we were than they were in many other parts of the region. Nonetheless, this was in many ways an existential experience of environmental degradation for me. It was one of the most striking examples in my life of being engulfed personally in the symptoms of the world's ecological crisis to the extent that it was impossible to delude myself into thinking that I could possibly escape from that cloud. There was nowhere to get away from it. The haze was everywhere. Now, those who have lived in Southeast Asia longer than I have, this haze is hardly a new phenomenon, though that 2013 edition was considered the worst in over a decade. I wrote these words quite some time ago. The one that is currently occurring may well be worse. Now, these annual haze clouds have occurred for at least as far back as 1982 and have been a regional issue, particularly since 1997-98, which were especially intense years. And this haze is primarily attributed to agricultural fires, particularly in Sumatra. Yet the debate over causation has been heated, as it were. Are those who are working the land to blame for this? Or are the international owners of the plantations to blame? Or is it larger economic structural forces? And so much of this debate centers around which country has responsibility to deal with the issue. Now, I have no expertise to offer on questions of determining causation and who is responsible for fixing the problem in any particular technical sense. Indeed, as we shall see, I have questions about the notion of direct causation. Rather, what I want to suggest is that the Hayes highlights a philosophical and theological challenge to the notion of object and personal relations commonly employed by Christian theology. It demonstrates that the scale with which we consider these concepts is insufficient to the scale of the issues that our world faces, the issues that theology must deal with. And so I argue that Timothy Morton's concept of hyperobjects is a helpful way to frame this anew, particularly in the age of ecological devastation. Indeed, I want to suggest that the haze is an important example of what a hyperobject is that is facing the Southeast Asian region. So before turning to Morton's concept of hyperobjects, let's get an understanding of relationality and how it has been used um, in particularly in modern Protestant um, theology. That is the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber's I and thou or I and you relationship, particularly with the, an interest in the ecological dimensions of this concept. So Buber's classic account of this relationship between a self and an other is best known logic, theologically for its account of the encounter the encounter between a self and God. In this account, Buber strives simultaneously to describe a relationship with God who is personal, while also allowing a mystical sense of a di pervasive divine presence. And so his basic distinction is between two types of relationships, the I-it and the I-you. An I-it relationship is instrumental. A book or a screwdriver or a car are all examples of an it. They are mere objects to be used by humanity. IU relationships, however, are more profound. 
They involve recognition of the deep value of the other as having its own unique subjectivity. And Buber is quite insistent that God cannot be reduced to an it. Religions have continually made this mistake throughout history, but an instrumentalized God is not a true God. Too often, theological thought on God as a person falls into this trap. While on the other end, speculation about God as a pervasive force too often runs the risk of seeing God as a principle that lacks personal individual relationships. And so Buber seeks to avoid both ends of this bind. He writes, by its very nature, the eternal you cannot become an it, because by its very nature, it cannot be placed within measure and limit. If we say, I believe that he is, even he is still a metaphor, while you is not. So in this way, Buber searches to articulate a sense of God as one who can be addressed in a direct way, but is not instrumentalized. The essential nature of God is one who is spoken to, not one who is spoken of. This characteristic changes the quality of the method of relating to God. The meeting between the subject I and the object you is an exchange between agential parties who are not merely objects, but are capable of subjectivity. Now, the theological personalism of this work resonated with the theological projects of many of the so-called crisis or neo-Orthodox Protestant theologians of that era. Yet for various reasons, these theologians minimize the mystical dimension of Buber's thought. While using Buber's basic distinctions, they restricted the I-U relationship to being between two humans or between humans and God. Buber himself, however, had a much broader understanding of the relationship. He felt it was possible to have a mystical sense of the you-ness of the world beyond humanity in a way that did not undermine, but in fact could enhance the human relationship with God. Now, this was not his primary focus, but Buber allows that non-human creatures need not be reduced to an it. He suggests that a certain type of reciprocity is possible through the non-human world's tendency towards spontaneity. Thus, higher animals have the greatest potential for mutuality, while lower animals, plants, non-living materials have some potential, but notably less. There's no one set answer for human relations to the more than human world. In an interview, he allows that he sees several different grades of capacity for mutuality. In other words, some animals have more ability to be a you than others, but it's impossible to set up criteria for what constitutes thouness. In fact, Buber allows for an even deeper sense of the non-human you. The classic text for Buber's reflection on the possibility of such an extension of the IU relationship beyond just the human realm, is one in which he contemplates the relation between a person and a tree. He writes of how he can contemplate the tree, sense its sucking with its roots and rustling with its leaves. He can categorize it, externalize it. Those are all I-it relations. But he muses, it can also happen, if will and grace are joined, that I, as I contemplate the tree, I am drawn into a relation and the tree ceases to be an it. That is, a profound sense of the tree's subjectivity may arise. In such moments, a person can relate to some degree to non-human living, living entities in an I-U manner. Now, Buber's search to articulate the re relation of humans to the non-human world is related to a larger theological issue for him. Buber sees the I-U relationship with God as providing a foundation for a type of mystical sense of God's presence in the world and personally in his life. He suggests, quote, I know nothing of a world and of worldly life that separate us from God. God embraces, but is not the universe. Just so God embraces, but is not myself, end quote. Thus for Buber, relating to an object as an it alienates it from the relational sacredness imbued by the divine you. That is, God is directly related to the world, and because of this relationship, 
Buber has a mystical sense of connection with the more than human world. It is because of this mystical sense that he searches so desperately to articulate a more than I, it relationship between humans and the natural world. Now, the American Lutheran theologian, Paul Santmeyer, who was one of the pioneers of eco-theology, finds much ecological worth in Buber's thought, but suggests some modifications in order to answer the open-ended question of human relations to the more than human world. Specifically, he calls for a third category, which he names the I-ENDS relationship, E-N-S. He feels that this new category offers the potential to classify the sense of connection to the more than human world of which Buber had this mystical sense. Santmeyer suggests that the I-ENDS relationship remedies the problems that Buber had with describing human interactions with the material world. Santmeyer takes the term ENDS from the Latin participle for being. This sort of relationship does not follow one to see an object as a means to an end, as an I-it relationship would, or to enter into a mutual relationship with it, as the I-thou relationship requires. Instead, the I-ends relationship simply sees the non-human other for its givenness. In its givenness, the ends has its own intrinsic value. It is there for its own sake and cannot be penetrated. Humans are not projecting onto the ends an instrumental value or solely a divinely derived value, but take the ends for its own sake. There is an element of mystery to an ends in that it exceeds the eye's expectation. The ends cannot be captured by the eye. At the same time, the eye can contemplate the ends and be captivated by its givenness and completeness. The ends can be appreciated for its beauty. St. Meyer says, quote, one might say tentatively that the ends is beautiful, whether in a simple or profound way, whether beautiful in the strict sense or sublime, because it is an integrated whole. It displays unity and diversity and harmony with each other, end quote. So appreciating the ends for its beauty is appreciating it for its otherness. It is approaching the other not as useful or as mutual, but as wonderful. The I ends relationship calls for approaching the other with an attitude of wonder. This approach means humbly entering into an encounter with the other entity without agenda or preconception. Now, Santmeyer, as a Lutheran theologian, relates his proposal to Martin Luther's oft overlooked theology of divine imminence. That is, for Luther, our life should be one of wondering at the goodness of the world. Luther notes, if you really examined a kernel of grain thoroughly, you would die of wonder. So Luther insists that we should have a mystical sense of God's presence in the world. The fact that we are unable to see this divine presence is, for him, evidence of the sway our sin has over us. And so St. Meyer agrees with Luther, but he also wants to add that we should wonder at the world simply because it exists, not exclusively because it is imbued with Christ. Now, as helpful and influential as Buber's philosophy of the IU and St. Meyer's IN's contributions are for ecologically concerned theological reflection, there are some significant limitations to this framing of human relations in the world. Three in particular concern me. First is the separation of subject and object. Certainly for Buber, an I only comes to be recognized in relationship to another, whether a you or an it. A subject cannot recognize itself without a relationship to something else. Yet this relationship implies a gap between the self and the other that allows for that recognition. As he notes in his reflection on a tree, relation is reciprocity. So the cost of mutuality is difference, even if there is also a connection with the divine, within the divine. In the same way, Santmeyer's I end relationship does not adequately address the concept that nature is pure, not purely external, but also inside the self. Certainly, Santmeyer doesn't deal with this issue. The reality of human materiality is that we are composed of dust. 
We are the dust of the earth, as Genesis insists. The dust is not fully separated from us, but part of us. And so degradation of that dust is also degradation of ourselves. Neither Buber's thought nor St. Meyer's addition to it attend to this dimension of earthly existence. And this brings us to my second concern with St. Meyer's proposal, namely the limitation to a focus on wonder. Certainly, I don't disagree with him about the importance of wonder as the basis of a Christian spiritual life that celebrates God's nearness. However, given the widespread threats and ecological devastation in our world today, we must also give a theological account of the negative aspects at work in the more than human world. We must account not just for the glory of God in the tiny seed, but also the destructive evil of pollution, climate change, species and habitat loss, deforestation. And so building on these two concerns, <clears throat> the third limitation with the I, you, I, it, I, ends trio that I wish to suggest is that it does not sufficiently account for forces at work in the world. Can forces such as seasonal change, volcanoes, earthquakes, be considered an ends? An it, a you? While we are affected by such forces, it's hard to imagine a mystical contemplation of them or any kind of mutuality with these sorts of things. If the concept of ends has difficulty dealing with these forces, what about larger and more menacing forces, such as global warming or the haze? These phenomena are not only on a greater scale of regional and global destruction than a local earthquake, but they also have a human origin that does not allow for the same quality of distance from us that we can imagine a change of seasons to have. So the personalist nature of Buber's thought would seem to have reached its limit in such a massive and sprawling phenomena as the haze. And so this is why I turn to Morton's more recent discussion of hyperobjects as a helpful addition to theological understandings of relations between humans and the more human world. And so hyperobjects is Morton's term for large scale phenomena that occur over time. Climate change is a prime example of a hyperobject. Global warming cannot be easily touched or pinpointed as a particular thing, and yet it is a phenomenon that causes great impact on the world. We cannot see it as such, and yet we see manifestations of it. We cannot see a hyperobject, Morton insists, because we are always already inside of it. There is no classic separation of the self and the object in a I-thou sense we cannot see the fullness of the haze. Not only does it cover too large of an area, but it persists over time. Even more fundamentally, it engulfs us. As the haze spread around my apartment, there was no way to avoid breathing in at least some of the fumes, no matter how well sealed my doors and windows were. The particles of pollution in the air then became part of me so that I could no longer be fully separate from the haze. I became embedded in it, or what Mark, uh, Morton would call the viscosity of hyperobjects. They trap us inside. And so the key underlying concept behind Morton's description is that hyperobjects are objects that exist on a scale larger than the human mind can perceive. It's important to note that for Morton, hyperobjects are not abstractions, not platonic forms. Rather, they are existent entities which have an essential property of withdrawal. They withdraw from our senses. In terms of the haze, it is withdrawn because it is diffuse. We cannot touch the haze as such. We can't define precise boundaries for it or even give a precise chemical composition of it. It is amorphous, but it is very much a real entity. In other words, a withdrawn entity is never fully there. There's no objective place from which to recognize the object as an object. For Morton, we are always already inside a hyperobject, and so there's no away space from which we can view it. Rather, hyperobjects are massively distributed, and this means that they not only lack a specific locality, but they also lack concrete temporality. 
Hyperobjects extend over space and time. They do not quite exist in the present. Rather, a hyperobject cannot be confined to a single moment. Again, using global warming as a prime example, he notes that it covers the entire face of the Earth, and 75% of it extends 500 years into the future. So he understands global warming as a thing, but a thing that can never be fully present to us as human beings. Indeed, Morton notes that the concept of the present is, in fact, an abstraction to him. He argues, what is called the present is simply a, reific re a reification, an arbitrary boundary drawn around things by a particular entity. In other words, we might refer to the present in reality, that what we refer to the present in, in reality is a gaping fissure between past and future. And as such, it doesn't truly exist. It is a non-existence. Therefore, objects are never present, but always withdrawn. He redefines the future as the realm of essence of an object and the past as the domain of its appearance. An essence of an object is always yet to come, while what has come is the appearance of that object. The scale of the intersection of these two dimensions is relatively small for humans compared to the vastness of a hyperobject. Therefore, we can only pick up on the footprints of this hyperobject. We can sense hints of its appearance that bring us to some sense of its essence. In fact, this would lead us to understand the haze not as a hyperobject itself, but rather the footprint of the hyperobject, commonly called deforestation. Deforestation as such cannot be seen. Of course, trees being cut down can be seen, but deforestation is more than just the um, particular instance of trees being cut down. That action is a footprint of the hyperobject. Deforestation also includes the people involved in clearing the forests, the economic systems that give financial incentive to engage in deforestation, the animals whose homes are lost in this deforestation. All of these actors play a part in this ongoing event of deforestation, and Morton sees each of these myriad relationships to be an object within the larger hyperobject. And so he calls this matrix or mesh of objective relationships interobjectivity. All of them are enmeshed in deforestation. The pollution in the haze does not leave, but rather dissipates or settles. Indeed, as we breathe it in, it becomes part of us. We are also part of the economic systems that propel deforestation so that we cannot be dissociated with either cause or effect. In this sense, the haze becomes part of our very being so that it cannot be separated from our very selves. Thus, the net ensnaring those responsible for deforestation, as if we could so easily track causation, is indeed very wide. In essence, what Morton is suggesting is that much of what we consider to be processes in this world are in fact objects that extend beyond a series of concrete realities. If time is seen on the scale of the hyperobject, the fluctuations that appear as processes to us are inconsequential. Just as the movements of electrons within the atomic structure of the chair you're sitting on seem inconsequential to your perception that it is a stable object. The benefit of Morton's hyperobject theory is its challenging of constructions of causality by deconstructing the separation of subject and object. As we have seen from his understanding of interobjectivity, there is no easy divide between the subject and object when you consider a hyperobject. We both contribute to the haze and are shaped by it. It is impossible to draw straight lines of causation for, foot, for the footprints of the withdrawn object. This is the reason there can be no proof of a direct link between any particular action in global warming and no identification of an unambiguous culprit behind the haze. There are only indirect webs of interrelated potential causations that interact in ways that increase probability of causation. So Morton suggests that no object has intrinsic properties at all, but rather potentialities 
that become developed and sharply defined in relation to another object with which it interacts. Such a sense of relationality is not merely accidental. Rather, an object has no essence until it interacts with another, which then co-create each other's essences. The object is not an object until it is also a subject. Recalling that for Morton, the essence of an object is its future, the creation of a subject object is thus the creation of its future, which then begins to appear as a past. Well, as we have seen, Buber recognizes that an eye cannot recognize itself until it encounters an other. Morton's suggestion goes beyond this in that he denies any essential characteristics to an entity until it interacts with another entity. So how might this concept of hyperobjects be helpful for a theory of object relations within a Christian theology? In particular, my interest is how a concept of hyperobjects might supplement Santmeyer's I ends relationship to address the three limitations that I noted earlier. Perhaps most obviously, the expansion of the concept of an object to a larger scale allows for blurrier lines between subjects and objects. It is not that the relations of I U, I it, or I ends are discarded. Rather, they are enfolded within a larger object structure of the hyperobject. Inside the hyperobject, there are I U and I it and I ends relationships, but they are relative rather than absolute. The absolute difference that appears on the everyday scale begins to dissolve when viewed within the hyperobject. Over time, I am shaped by my interaction with others in multitudinous ways, and my interaction shapes them as well. There's some resonance here with Buber's understanding of God's relatedness to the world and to individuals, but hyperobjects moves a step further. Again, it's not just that I can only recognize myself as a subject through relationship, as Buber suggests but rather that intersubjectivity is constitutive of my very existence. Similarly, Morton's insistence that hyperobjects are always negative provides a counterbalance to the one-sided focus on wonder at the ends. That is, for Morton, hyperobjects are always destructive entities, such as global warming or deforestation. He's attempting to account for these widespread destructive forces that arise from complex human interactions with the more than human world. So in looking at the world, he's attempting to call us to recognize our inescapable involvement in causing the ugliness and destruction of the earth. I suspect that Mark Morton goes too far in only considering the agents of devastation in the world. But if we take it together with Santmeyer, I believe we find an appropriate balance between wondering at the world and being shocked at the destructive forces that we have unleashed within it. Recognizing the destructive power of hyperobjects involves recognizing our corporate human sin in covering a world that should be full of wonder with ugly destruction and pollution. Just as for Luther failing to see the wonder in the kernel of corn is evidence of our personal sin. Indeed, through recognizing the negative power of hyperobjects, we might be able to see the world as both wonderful and fallen. And so the third limitation I noted of Santmeyer's proposal of the ends was its need for an ability to account for forces as well as objects. The concept of hyperobjects redefines these forces and processes as elements of a hyperobject, giving an account of them. No force is untouched by the weight of human decisions that have been given that have given rise to the existence of hyperobjects. Seasonal pat um, patterns are shifting by, by global warming, while the haze interacts in complex ways with wind and weather patterns. Yet asking for direct causation for these issues is not the proper question. We find ourselves in a sea of interactions that both shape us and are shaped by our actions. Through my participation in global economic systems, I am at one level responsible for the haze, but my personal actions are but a small contributing factor. The cancer that my wife developed a year after being exposed to the haze was unlikely directly caused by that exposure, but it is impossible to say with any certainty whether or not it was a factor. And she is healthy now. This incalculable matrix of interaction is the footprint of a hyperobject. And so moving beyond Morton, I believe his concept provides some tools for constructive theological use. In particular, I suggest that the concept of hyperobjects 
may help open new angles for viewing core Christian metaphors, such as the kingdom of God. The classic New Testament tension of the already not yet character of the new creation in Christ of the kingdom of God has frequently been understood to be an eschatological paradox. But if we consider the new creation as a hyper object, perhaps new nuances might appear. The new creation could thus be seen as a real but withdrawn object, appearing non-locally and non-temporally, with much of it residing in the future. There's some important potential for dialogue here, for example, with Moltmann's eschatological understanding of God's future glory being God's mode of being within history, so that this future shapes every historical time, and there could be some fruitful dialogue here, though that's beyond what we can get into today. Such theological dis discussion would not strictly follow Morton's account of the hyperobject. It would necessarily challenge his insistence on them being exclusively negative. That is, God's works, at work such as the advent of the new creation, are positive gifts that are massively distributed. What I do find helpful in Morton's thought, however, is the concept of objects that extend beyond the scale of human imagining. Such a concept moves us beyond an ontology of static materialism and static objects. It can be a philosophical tool for re-articulating the Christian claim of the infinite, the, in, the timeless God who is incarnationally present and engaged in the finite chronology of this world. Thank you.